Good afternoon. Welcome to the last session of the conference. First, I'd like to say how impressed I am to see how many of you actually came. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Jim Yannick. I'm an end-user computing architect in the end-user computing business unit at VMware. Been with the company for about seven and a half years. How many of you came to other app volume sessions that I did this week? A few of you, okay. So today we're gonna talk about app volumes, tips, tricks, and troubleshooting. We're gonna get into some overview material, but mostly we're gonna dive into some specifics about setting up app volumes, uh, kind of configuration things. And we're going to get into a little bit of deep things with uh, some of the logs and, and troubleshooting, just to kind of give you some tools around that. Uh, typical disclaimer, if I say anything that's forward looking in roadmap, that's just what it is, it's roadmap, it may or may not change. So we're gonna do an, a product overview. And I'll apologize in advance for those of you who've been to my sessions before. You know I'm, I'm fighting a cold. This is my fifth session of the week, uh, so my voice is giving out. Uh, we're going to do a technical overview, a uh, technical deep dive. We're going to get into some examples of troubleshooting, and then I'll just show you some additional resources you can look at. So first, an overview um, in terms of app volumes. I, I've talked about this before, those of you who've been to the sessions before. When we look at traditional desktops, and especially related to delivering the applications, when we install apps, they're really tied to that OS, they're tied to that desktop. Whether it's a physical or a virtual desktop doesn't really matter. Uh, with app volumes, we start to introduce a just-in-time concept. So we want to decouple the OS from those applications. Um, we also decouple from, from settings, too, if we're using User Environment Manager, but we're not talking about UEM in this session. We're sticking with app volumes. There's a couple of constructs here that I'll get into, uh, app stacks and writable volumes. App stacks are VMDKs where I install my applications. And if you look at the way they're represented there, <coughs> you see that those app stacks have multiple applications in them. And that's typically what I would do, is create an app stack, let's say for Office, and install all the Office applications. It doesn't really matter how many applications you put in that app stack, um, uh, but we wanna group them. Uh, because what we can do is we can give users multiple app stacks to kind of construct their set of applications. So maybe they get the core apps that everybody in the company gets, and then maybe they get the engineering department applications. We also have the ability to use a writable volume. <coughs> this gives us the ability to persist uh, user settings, user installed applications, profile information, user data across sessions. So now I can go with a very non-persistent desktop, so that OS in the bottom there can be a non-persistent floating desktop and I can still give a uh, persistent user experience. Uh, let's talk a little bit about application provisioning. Um, we don't have to sequence, we don't have to package, we don't have to stream. Uh, provisioning is just about as simple as installing the applications. We, we create a new empty app stack, and app stacks come with a set of templates that are basically those empty VMDKs with the right metadata in them that we can create app stacks in. We attach that to a provisioning machine. So I'm going to take a very, very clean machine, uh, probably a new VM that has <coughs> just the minimal amount of things need to be installed on it, patched up to date, and I'm going to attach a, an app stack template to it, and I'm going to put it in provisioning mode, which puts it into a read-write mode, and I, I install my applications. During those installs, if I need to reboot, I can reboot as many times as I need to. I close that out, and then <coughs> those applications are ready to be provisioned to users. So when we talk about provisioning them to users, we also talk about management. So what I can do is, uh, whether the user has a VDI desktop, an RDSH desktop, or an RDS application, <coughs> I can provision those app stacks. And you see in the middle there, I'm kind of representing three different app stacks that are being provisioned to this user. Uh, a engineering app stack, a finance app stack, and a core apps app stack. Um, one of the things I can do is update. So let's say I need to update my core apps. What I can do is put that app, uh, app stack in provisioning mode. I can attach it to that provisioning machine. I can do updates. So maybe I need to patch the software, or update the software, or maybe install a new piece of software in it. And then I can exchange it. So the, the user's using the core apps application, and then I can say, okay, now I've finished provisioning this new updated core apps app stack. What I'll do is I'll set it, uh, provision it to them so the next time they log in or the next time they reboot, 
the old core apps app stack will be removed and the new one will be plugged in so they'll get the updates the nice thing about this is my maintenance windows can go down for applications because I can do all of that updating offline and then just swap it out for the user for the next time they log in. Okay, we'll do a little bit more of a technical overview here, some of the components of app stacks or app volumes and get a little deeper. So first is the app volumes manager. <coughs> so the app volumes manager is the broker, much as the the view connection or the view manager, the view connection broker is the broker for, for the Horizon desktops. Um, this is where I, 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 my agent checks into and initially connects to. And this is where I, as an as a administrator, can create app stacks, assign app stacks, monitor the environment, et cetera. There's the agent. So the agent is what runs on the, the, um, the virtual desktop. So I'm going to install that on my virtual desktop. Uh, it redirects system and registry uh, for the writable volume if I need to do that. Uh, writable volumes are optional. Uh, that's what I use for the persistent. And it also, this is what checks in and communicates with the app volume manager. I'll talk a little bit about that communication as we get a little deeper here. The provisioning VM I already mentioned. This is a, a VM or set of VMs that are dedicated to <coughs> the creation of app stacks. So we want it to be pretty clean. We don't want it to be the five-year-old image that you P to V'd and has all sorts of things installed on it. We want it to be a very clean image, uh, much as we do when we do like thin app packaging, for those of you familiar with that. Um, I can use snapshots for rollback, and this is what I use to provision and update my applications. The app stack, as I mentioned, is a read-only volume, and this is where the applications are. It's a many-to-one thing. So I have one app stack, and I've got a bunch of users who are using that app stack. We'll talk a little bit about scale. I'll qualify a bunch of users a little better than that. But it's multiple users. And uh, it gives me the ability to provide uh, application virtualization by, uh, by um, policy. And then there's the writable volume. This is where the user can persist, user installed applications, uh, profile information, data. And it's a one-to-one. -one. So any user who wants, who needs to do that has to have their own writable volume. App stacks are one-to-many, writable volumes are one-to-one. -one. Uh, just some requirements. Um, in terms of the server, operating system version, and, uh, and CPU requirements, it's actually pretty lightweight. You know, two vCPUs, four CPUs are actually recommended, four gig of RAM, small disk footprint. We require SQL Server, uh, 2008 R2 or 2012, uh, R 2012 R2 as well. Um, and then on the client side, Windows 7 and 8.1, Windows 10 coming, so we'll ship uh, the 2.10 version of App Volumes fairly soon, and then the 3.0 3 version following that will have Windows 10 support. <coughs> in terms of the management server, uh, just some general things in terms of uh, um, requirements there. It's, it's all documented and, and it's all here in the slide for your reference as well. So database. So we do support SQL Express 2008 R2 for non-production. So if you're going to do a POC, if you're going to set this up in a test dev environment, you're going to play around with it in the lab, um, Express is fine. However, for production, we really want SQL 2000, a full-blown full, full SQL. So right now, 2008 R2 or 2012 standard and above for production. We do communicate with Active Directory. Most of the time, you're going to do uh, a, a guest in, or a, a user-based entitlement. So we're going to use an Active Directory group, Active Directory OU, or even just an Active Directory user. So we need to be able to communicate with AD. Um, just really a, <coughs> a standard account for permission. Um, if I'm using an ESX host or vCenter, which I have to use, one or the other, I need to have a user that has administrative privileges to vCenter or a root user on that ESX host to be able to uh, manage those app stack mounts. Because those, again, it's a VMDK, and we're going to hot, hot attach those VMDKs to the, end, to the end points or to the uh, VMs. Um, most of the uh, communications are on port 80443. I've got a diagram for your reference. Uh, that is also configurable if you want to use different ports. Uh, just a quick run through of the install steps. 
The nice thing about App Volumes is if you want to try it out, it's really pretty easy to install. Uh, you can probably get it up and running and provision a, your first app stack within an hour or so. It, it really is pretty lightweight, especially in a lab environment. I'm not saying you're going to roll it out in production that quickly, but to get it up and running. You install the App Volume Manager. Uh, you go through the initial configuration. There's some licensing, and then there's uh, setting up where the templates get writ written out. The templates are things that we use to create the writable volumes and to create the app stacks. There's a standard template that comes with it for the app, app stack that's 20 gigs. Uh, we typically want to make those smaller than the, than the default, the 20 gig. We want to get it closer to uh, the size of the application stack that you're going to put in it, just so you're not using excess disk space. Um, when we write out the first one, we'll thin provision it, but as we replicate it across storage, and I'll talk about that a little bit, um, it'll blow up to its full size, so we want to we slim it down. You build your provisioning VMs, and you're basically ready to create an app stack at that point. <coughs> okay, a little bit more about provisioning applications, and I'll just build this out. Again, I'm mounting that app stack, so I use the base template, as uh, I mount it as a uh, read-write, so I put it in provisioning mode. And this is something you go in and do in the console. You say, I'm going to go provision an app stack. You pick your, um, your provisioning machine. You might have three or four of them. You, you pick one, you, you connect that, and then you're in provisioning mode. Uh, what's going to happen then is I'm going to install my applications. And as we're seeing here, I can install a bunch of applications. Um, it's going to do all the file associations, registry entries, you know, write out whatever data that needs to be written out. And then once it's done, <coughs> I end the provisioning process, I make the app stack read-only, and then it's ready to be provisioned to users. The writable volume is the other piece here. So this is where I can you know, um, have user settings. I can allow users to install their own applications. There are, there are three templates that we ship with it. There's just a standard uh, writable volume template. There's a writable volume with, uh, with user-installed applications. It gives the users the right to install apps. And then there's one with user applications and profile. That one's going to change a little bit in a future version, the, the one with the profile. We're going to handle profiles a little differently moving forward. So stay tuned on that. Um, you can also make custom templates. Um, and really, when it says use case requirements, it's about the sizing. It's about how much space you want to give those users and uh, how much space is going to be required to, for them to be able to do their jobs. The users have to have, obviously, administrative rights to do this. So if you're going to have users that don't have administrative rights um, and are just going to be using app stacks, you wouldn't necessarily use a writable volume. But for a lot of use cases like developers and power users, you're going to want to give them the ability to do user installed apps. Um, so talking a little bit more about provisioning here. So you're going to start with that clean image. And this is where you go in and you create your app stack. So I'm going to create this app stack in, in App Volumes Manager. This is what it looks like in the user interface. Um, I'm going to choose that provisioning VM. So I mentioned that I've got my list of computers that I could use for the provisioning VM. I'm going to uh, assign that template to it. It's going to go into that read-write mode. Then that VMDK is going to actually get attached. So you see that hard disk 4 up there, virtual disk, and you show it's a, a VMDK, and you notice it's still 20 gigs. So it's at default 20 gigs. Again, uh, in normal operation, you're going to want to use a smaller template than that. We're just using the default template in this example. Then we're in provisioning mode. So once we see this dialog, now we can start installing applications. And as I said, I can reboot multiple times if I need to, if, if I need to do that when the, the application configuration is happening. Uh, once that's done, I, you know, I finish it out. So what I have to do at that point is um, reboot. So I have to do a final reboot. I have to tell it now I'm done provisioning. And then it's going to go ahead and uh, restart, detach that VMDK, let you know that provisioning is done, and then that app, that app stack is ready to be provisioned to, to users. So now I can assign it to end users. OK, um, let me talk a little bit about storage groups here. So when I create app stacks, I, I need to store them someplace, obviously. Um, when I create a storage group, I can set up automatic replication for app stacks. So if you look at the graphic over there, 
you see the yellow disk. Um, it is an app stack. So if I turn replication on in a storage group, I'll automatically replicate that app stack across all of the data stores that are part of that storage group. So when we get to talking about scale here, one of the things that this does is help me do uh, I.O. aggregation. So now if it's across more data stores, I can attach more users to it, it can handle more IOPS. And I can automatically set that up. Now writable volumes work a little bit differently. Um, the orange and purple there represent writable volumes. And I can spread them evenly across the data stores or I can spread them sequentially across the data stores. I can also assign them to specific tiers of storage. Your user profiles are going to be a little different in terms of how they use a writable volume. Some users are going to use it pretty sparingly. They might uh, install an application every once in a while. They might uh, write out some profile updates every once in a while. Other users will use it really hard because they're maybe a developer and they're constantly installing new applications. Uh, they're moving uh, large data files in there. So they may need a higher tier of storage. So you can kind of put it on whatever tier of storage makes the most sense for, for your use case. Okay, now we're going to go a little deeper. So when we talk about the app volumes agent, there are four basic events that it, it has. There's a startup and a shutdown, a login and a logout. And different things happen during each of these events. For those of you who went, went to my other session, um, that was the app volumes uh, overview, we talked about each one of these. But I'm going to focus right now on the login because it's probably the most important one as far as uh, when you're going to be in, in some troubleshooting motions. And so understanding what's going on is really helpful. So when I log in, the app volumes agent is going to check in with that app volumes manager. So it's going to check in with that broker server. Um, <coughs> at that point, the agent is going to check to see if there's any unfinished business from the last session. Are there any pending attachments? Are there any pending unattachments? And it's going to deal with that. At that point, it'll check for a machine-based attachment. So if I have two ways of making an assignment of an app volume, user-based, machine-based. By far, you're mostly going to use user-based. Machine-based would be, for example, if it were an RDS 8 server or a Zen app host, or maybe it's a kiosk machine that users are just going to walk up to. If I do a machine-based attachment, it's only going to do that, and then there'll be no, there'll be no user-based attachments after after that. So if the user happens to have user uh, entitlements, it won't attach those. It's going to check in with the database. <coughs> so the database is going to find out what assignments that the logged in user has, and then it's going to go ahead and mount those assigned attached volumes. It will mount the writable volume first, if the user has one, and then any of the app stacks. Now the app stack order that they, can, that they get loaded in can be changed. When you do the assignment, you can go and change it in the console uh, so that I can have a hierarchy. So for example, if I have an app stack that has Office, and then I have a separate app stack that has Office plugins, I probably want to load the Office app stack first and then load the, the uh, Office plugin app stack because I want to get those dependencies in place first. For <coughs> Specifically for Horizon, we have an a broker integration service. What the broker integration service does is it installs on the Horizon brokers. So when I, as a user, log in and connect to a broker, uh, we're going to go and check with the app volumes assignments fairly quickly. As soon as I select the desktop or I select an RDSH application, we're going to see if there's any app volumes assignments. And it'll go and let App Volumes Manager know that a user is logging in, and it'll start the process of getting those attachments done to that machine. It's meant to speed up logins for the user. It's not like a, a huge speed up. It's, it, we're talking about a couple seconds here. But you know, when, when, we're, when we're trying to get logins as quickly as possible, every second that we can shave off really, really matters. So let's talk about best practices and uh, kind of rules to scale here. So first of all, when we're talking about App Volumes Manager, if you're installing it in your lab to try out, by all means, install one manager. But if you're going into production, minimum of two managers, and probably more than that, depending on how much you're scaling up. We want to make sure we have something that we can fall over to. Because as you'll see when I go through some of the troubleshooting scenarios, 
if the agent can't con communicate with the app lines manager, nothing is going to happen. The user is not going to get their app stacks. Uh, obviously, if you're using multiples, we recommend a load balancer in production. Um, right now, <coughs> the tested known login rate or uh, connection rate is one login per second per app volumes manager. You're going to see that scale increase pretty dramatically. Um, we've already got you know 210 coming, and we're going to double that. And then I think with 3.0, we're shooting for an even bigger number. But uh, it's just something to keep in mind because if I if I have a situation where I have a lot of users logging in at once, uh, let's say a call center comes in and everybody sort of logs in at the same time, you want to be able to handle those things without people waiting, you know, kind of at the welcome screen for the app volumes uh, agent to come back. The app volumes agent will keep trying. Uh, the timeout is 300 seconds. Uh, you can adjust that. There's registry keys you can adjust that, but it's, it'll, it'll continue to try. We use a SQL server. I'll talk about that a little more when we get into some of the deeper troubleshooting stuff. Want to make sure that's clustered. Want to make sure the SQL server is available. If I can't look up uh, my machines and my users, uh, I can't attach the app stack, so it really needs to be up. Uh, just as a general rule, one app stack per about a virtual machine. So remember when I talked about storage groups and writing multiple copies of the app stack out? If I need to scale to 2,000 users, 3,000 users, 4,000 users, I need to make sure I have additional copies of the app stack so I can handle that scale. We really recommend no more than about 15 app stacks per VM. So you're going to have your writable, and then you're going to have any app stack. So I can have multiple app stacks attached to a VM. That doesn't mean 15 applications, because remember, in a single app stack, I could have you know, 20, 30, 50 applications installed. I'll show you a quick little demo here where we have one with 70 installed. Um, and then uh, you know, about 10,000 agents per app volumes manager cluster. That's really about the, uh, uh, the view block and pod architecture, which um, is on the next slide. I'll just briefly talk about this. When we talk about larger scale architectures for Horizon, uh, we talk about blocks, which is where we put our desktops and our RDS sessions. We want to have about 2,000 sessions in there. And then we have the management block. Um, we have a vCenter in there. Um, we have our connection servers in there. But that's also where the app volumes managers will live. So as I said, I want to have at least two app volumes managers, but I want to have more than that. So if I really have, let's say, 6,000 users here, I probably want to have six, seven, or eight app volumes managers in there to, to to handle that load. Um, this is the, the port diagram, uh, just for your reference here. As I mentioned, most of the communications happening over port 80 and port 443. Uh, the agent communications are on 80. Uh, the, the communications between the app volumes manager and, and vSphere is usually on 443. They're configurable. You can change them. We fully support that. Um, but pretty basic port diagram, but just wanted to have it for your reference. Um, you want to replace your default self-signed certificate? We can run with a self-signed certificate. In your lab, you're going to probably use a self-signed certificate, but for production, you're going to want to put in a, a real certificate. There's a, there's a KB on how to do that. It's fairly straightforward. Well, as easy as certificates get uh, you to, to replace that, but we, we want to do that. Um, one of the things we can do is if you've got thin apps or if you need to use thin apps for app isolation, you can deploy thin apps into an app stack. So a lot of people ask, well, now you have app volumes, do we still need thin app? Yes, potentially. If you need to deliver an old version of IE with a, you know, say IE8 with an older version of Java, you can do that through a thin app, put that thin app into the app stack, you can install it with the MSI installer or use thin reg to get it installed in there and then just deliver it to the user with the app stack. Uh, Read-only Active Directory service account, um, vCenter administrator privileges or ESXi root privileges required, as I, as I mentioned, to be able to actually uh, handle the mounts of the app volumes, the app stacks. OK, I'm just going to show you a quick little video here. Um, have any of you been down to the booth or, or done the lab and seen app volumes at work? Some of you? OK. This is just a, it's actually kind of an old demo video we've had around for a while. But it'll show. There we go. 
So we basically have a user here who, you know, we're just going to check who the user is. Um, we're going to go in and uh, actually see that right now they don't have a, a, a hard drive assigned as far as an app stack. We're going to go into app volumes and we're going to assign that user an app stack. And this stack has 70 applications in it. So we'll go in, assign that. We'll turn it on immediately. And this is all happening in real time. There's no sort of uh, monkey business with the, with the timing of the video. When we go back to the machine and look at the machine, right now you don't see any applications sitting there, but pretty quickly you'll see that drive. You can see the application starting to populate. You saw that drive attach. Now he's got 70 applications. Uh, they're all usable. And it's really, it really can be just that quick to get ap applications um, installed in the machine because we do that hot ad and the app volumes agent goes ahead and instantiates those applications and it all happens very rapidly. Okay. Okay, so here's the fun part. Where do we look when trouble strikes? So we know that always, you know, things can potentially go wrong. So we want to, I want to give you some pointers to areas that you can go to look at things. This is a little deep, uh, so bear with me a little bit. The, uh, I'm going to try to explain some of this stuff. What, I, what my goal here is, is to give you some tools about where you can go to look, to look for problems. So first, let's look at the console. This is the highest level. So. At the top of the console, the dashboard, uh, there's a, an available licenses section. Uh, it's really important to kind of keep track of what's going on with your licenses because if you run out of licenses, we won't mount app stacks anymore. So it's important to see what's going on. So you can get uh, a list of you know, your, your entitled users as well as your active users. The middle kind of shows your current utilization, a little chart that kind of goes on and shows you, you know, how many, how many users are actually logged in, how many computers are, are connected with app stacks. And on the bottom, I have a, a little list of recent events. So most recent logins, most recent computer boot ups, and most recent app stack attachments. And each one of those little links there are clickable. So I can click on a link there or a link there and I can get more detail of what, what's going on. So there's actually a lot of information just in the dashboard. There is a production log. The production log lives on the app volumes manager. So <coughs> as you can see here, um, the production log is viewable from a web browser. So I can point the web browser, it's currently at localhost slash log, but if I'm on another machine, I just go to the, the name of the, the host, the port, <laughs> and the log to be able to get to that, that log file. Um, the default log level is set to info. In general, that's where you want to leave it. I'll show you in a minute here how to turn it into debug. Debug is very verbose, so you don't want to necessarily leave it in, in debug in production all the time because it'll continually overwrite itself and you'll, you'll lose some information. So I want to do uh, info. Um, <coughs> each line here has a little prefix that tells you kind of where you're looking uh, in terms of what area this is coming from. And then I also can get to this from, uh, from the file system too. So if I, if I want to just go to the log file, maybe I want to grab it off the server and, and put it into some uh, program that I'm using to parse log files, I can do that from there. So we can build that out. So, the app volumes uses Nginx for the web server and uses Ruby. So a lot of development is done in Ruby. I'm going to talk about the Ruby console later. And we're using some standard libraries and modules. Uh, there's a Ruby Active Directory library. There's the uh, CVO module, which is the business logic for all of the backend transactions. Um, there's a, a vSphere and a SQL module. <coughs> and you see that <coughs> there are things like CVO and vSphere in the, uh, the production log that lets you know what module's in play. And the reason this is important is as you're troubleshooting, depending on the issue you're troubleshooting, you'll want to look for some of those key words. The other nice thing about this, any of you Ruby people out there, any of you do Ruby, Ruby coding? Well, nobody, okay, neither do I. I mean, I don't, I, so, but Google knows a lot about Ruby and since we're using a lot of standard libraries and standard calls, you can actually get a lot of information when you're trying to parse through the logs from Google.
Uh, this is where, <coughs> where I talked about increasing the logging level. So you see where it says debug up there. Uh, I've basically just gone in and edited this file and increased it to debug. There's a KB. So that KB at the bottom is the KB that will tell you how to get this into, into debug mode. As I said, this is something you want to do when you're troubleshooting and not necessarily leave it in debug mode. It also provides SQL logging, and we're going to talk a little bit more about SQL here in a minute. <coughs> okay, I'm looking at the client side now. So um, I can uh, change things in the, in, the, in the registry related to the client. So I can change things like what port it's using, um, what, uh, what machines it's pointing at. So like, for example, you see the ports are listed there. Um, I can also change things here like uh, we support multiple vCenters, we support multiple hosts, and you can set that up in the machine managers within the console, but I can also go in and add it here in the registry. So just wanted to let you know where the registry hive was for app volumes, and you'll notice it's right now still showing as cloud volumes. We, we acquired cloud volumes, and so in some of the code areas it's still showing as cloud volumes. You'll see that. Uh, that's why. Um, SQL database. So, oops, let me go back. Okay, so there, as I said, there is a SQL database. We're keeping a lot of information here. So there's, there's information about everything that happens, what succeeded, what failed. And then on a deeper level, let me just build this, um, we're keeping information about machine names and UUIDs. So every machine that's, that's managed in here is going to get a UUID. So you see a machine there that's called TP1 and it's got a big long UUID. That UUID relates to uh, a UUID in the vCenter database as well. So you see it's the same machine name, same UUID. When you're doing troubleshooting, knowing that UUID is important. So there's a ton of information in the SQL database. Um, I'm not, you know, a, a SQL reporting guru, but if you can na navigate through the database, if you can create reports, you can create custom reports about what's going on. One of my colleagues, Chris Halstead, who has a blog, he, he's actually really good with this. He wrote a, uh, an event alerter. So he went in and uh, he's grabbing information from the SQL database about different alerts that happened, and he'll send a, an email based on alerts. It's, a, it's just something he's published on his own private blog. It's not something that's a, a VMware-supported tool, but it'll give you an idea of some of the kind of information you can get out of the SQL database and some of the things that you can do with it. Um, so we have a, a set of agent log files. Uh, so there, there's two services. There's the svservice.log and there's the uh, uh, svdriver. Um, so there's two services. And then there's logs related to the services. Uh, this is a lot of information about the communication from the agent back to the app volumes manager. So if you're trying to troubleshoot a problem with a, a single user, for example, Grabbing these logs and taking a look at what's in here will get you uh, a lot of uh, diagnostic information about what's going on. Uh, so here's a little bit more information about some of the, uh, the registry entries. These are on the, uh, the agent side. So, um, for example, on the manager address uh, side, um, notice that we've got uh, in, the, in the cloud volumes agent, I can put up what, what, uh, um, what host that I'm, I'm going to and on what port. So in other words, what app volumes manager am I going to, what port. This is a little more detail on the registry. I mentioned earlier that you can add uh, different managed or uh, machine managers in here. So um, these on the bottom here where I'm listing uh, several servers. Uh, if you can't put a in your environment for whatever reason, we can go in and, and tell the, the agent, try this machine first, try that machine next, try that machine next. Obviously in production we really want the load balancer in place, but you have some flexibility to be able to do some things within the, the registry for the, uh, for the agent. Um, the agent service logs, so these, these uh, logs that I just showed you, uh, this is just a quick little um, uh, PowerShell command line to go and grab that log. So you can point PowerShell at a particular workstation at its uh, C dollar sign share, 
and go and grab that log and tail it. So then if you want to take a look at it and you're trying to troubleshoot a problem, you don't have to remote into the machine or go to the user's desk or anything like that. You can just go grab the log and bring it local and parse it. The agent driver log is in an ETL format. With version 2.9, we switched to an ETL format. Um, we're going to do some things with this ETL format moving forward with, uh, with a new consolidated console that will be coming towards the beginning of next year for managing. Um, but in the meantime, you can convert that ETL to XML. So I can take uh, um, the XML, and this is, this is how you do it. I'm not going to walk through these steps, but here it is documented for you so that I can now take that file and look at it in Event Viewer. So if I just want to get a better picture of it and make it a little easier to, to move around it, I can convert that ETL to XML and look at it in Event Viewer. Uh, I'm going to skip that. OK, Ruby console. So as I mentioned, a lot of what's going on with AppFlyums is in Ruby. Uh, <coughs> We were asked to include this information for reference. I would mostly point you at that big block that says caution in the middle. There are a number of things you can do in Ruby console. And the way you, you do the Ruby console is you just navigate to your um, app volumes uh, directory and then execute that um, script rails console. And that gives you this Ruby console. There are a ton of things you can do in there. Um, really, this is aimed at. There are some things you can't see in the UI. There are some things you can't do in the UI. So this gets you to objects that you can't get to from the UI. But you need to be careful, because you can actually completely destroy your environment. So I would caution you with this. It's, it's here for your reference. But if you don't know what you're doing, and I wouldn't necessarily go do this in a production environment unless your resume is really up to date and you're thinking about a new job. Just because it, you could potentially destroy something. Like, for example, I can take away all the pending activities. Um, on the admin side, I can add an ad, admin group. I can delete all the administrators. Uh, so there's some things, there, there's some very drastic things you can do with the Ruby console. But if you, if you feel comfortable with it, or if you're working with support and they're guiding you through the Ruby console, this is just a heads up that this may be something that, that you get asked to do. OK, just a couple examples here. Um, so I'm creating a new app stack, right? So I'm going to use a template, and I'm going to create from that template a new app stack. And in this case, it's uh, Office. So where I'm going to look for this happening, so let's say I'm running into problems with it, and I want to see what's going on. In that production log that I talk about, um, I can go in and I can see that there's a template in there. So I've got a template VMDK, and I'm going to copy that to my Office VMDK. So I can see that copy happen there in that production log. I can see what UUID of what machine that I'm working on is. And I can see um, if it does the mount. So if the, if the mount fails, I'll see that in here. If the mount's successful, I'll see it in there. Uh, keep in mind that UUID is some information that we can get out of the SQL database. So that's why I talked to you about the SQL database, is so you know where to go to get that UUID information. So, so far, we've looked at the SQL database, the production log. Also, for troubleshooting this, there's a log on the host. So there's a host D log, and I can get a little more information. I can see what state that the VM is in, that it's being reconfigured, and then I can see that the, the app stack was mounted. So I see the UUID of the machine, I see the, name of the, the path and name of the app stack, and I see that the hot ad was successful or wasn't successful. So there's a lot of tools you can use for troubleshooting. I realize this is really deep, but want to just give you some examples of things you can do for, for troubleshooting if you're running into problems. Um, another example, I'm creating a writable volume. So I'm going to create a writable volume, and I want to attach it to a machine called TP3. So again, I'm in that production log. And you can see I'm using a template here, uh, template UIA plus profile.vmdk which I'm going to copy and create a writable volume for a user. And we can see here that it's created. And at the bottom here, it gets a new name, right? So it's, it used to be um, the, the template name, and now it's got a name that's associated with that user. So if I'm troubleshooting issues where various pieces are unreachable, this is just to give you an idea where you can look at some of that. So in this case, app volume mate agent 
can't be reached by the machine. So there's uh, the manager itself uh, can't be reached by the agent machine. So uh, behavior is going to be if my users are logged in and they have app stacks and writable volumes, they're going to continue working. For new logins, I might get an error message on the agent machine. Um, basically, it'll probably be a, a message along the lines of virtualization unavailable and uh, things won't be mounted. So where I want to look, again, is in this case, in the SV service log. So that's the, the local log on the machine. So I can either uh, shadow the machine or I can go and grab the log with the, the PowerShell that I gave you. And I'm looking for things like uh, virtualization is disabled, I can't contact the app volumes manager. So I know I'm looking for some kind of connectivity problem here, but that'll validate that it's a connectivity problem. Uh, SQL database unreachable. So the SQL database can't be seen by the app volumes manager. Um, again, uh, in this situation, I'm going to get a UI that won't be available. Um, when the user's logged in, uh, things will continue to operate. Um, if, I, if, I, if a new user is logging in, they'll still be able to log in, but I'm going to have issues. Um, where I'm going to look for here is in the ODBC module. So remember I said there were different modules in the production logs. One of them is ODBC. I'm going to see some errors around the SQL server. Uh, could be uh, a lot of different reasons. Uh, maybe it's a, um, a port blocking issue. Maybe it's uh, somebody changed the, the administrator password for SQL, something like that. But at least I know that I've got a SQL problem. Uh, AD unreachable. So we use Active Directory, obviously, uh, to be able to um, associate the, uh, the users and groups to the uh, app stacks and the writable volumes. Um, what will happen here is uh, if I'm going to get an errors in the manager log, uh, manager UI will work, but there'll be errors. And then for new logins, users won't be able to get their app stacks or their writables because we can't look for the entitlements. Uh, very simple here. Remember I talked about those Ruby modules? So this is the Ruby Active Directory module. So it's showing me that I can't connect. So maybe I've got a DNS issue. Maybe my domain controllers are down. Maybe there's a port problem. Uh, but at least it shows me for sure where my issue is. Another thing that can happen is the vCenter can be unreachable. So I can't get to the vCenter. Um, the, I'll get it. Uh, things will work uh, partially, but I'll get that big red error message that says, you know, I, that things aren't working properly. Again, I'm going to look in that uh, production log. And in this case, I'm looking for our vSphere as the, the, course of the, the, the uh, cause of the problem. So there's going to be entries in there around that vSphere module. OK, so just sort of a, a few general things here. Getting help, obviously, read the documentation. None of us like to do that, but it, it's helpful. Uh, check your configuration. I would encourage you, if you're running into problems, to go to kb.vmware.com. I've already mentioned a couple of KBs that we have, but there's always new ones coming out, especially as we're finding issues, uh, fixing issues, or updating the code in terms of how to do different things. <coughs> there is a log collector tool. So I can, I can unzip that or grab that log collector tool from the ISO. And there's a 64-bit and a 32-bit version. And I can grab the uh, agent logs, I can grab the manager logs, and I can put those all in a support bundle. Uh, this would be if you were talking, especially if you're talking to tech support, they're going to want a support bundle like that. Uh, this is how they, you would go about getting that. And of course, if you're having problems, submit a support request. Um, don't, don't wait and just assume it's you. It could be us. So you know, submit a support request and get help. Here's a couple of additional resources, some white papers and documentation that, that are out there. And I wanted to leave time for questions. Uh, I think there's some microphones. Yeah, there's some microphones. So if you have a question, raise your hand, wait for a microphone so we get it on the recording. Yeah, one question from me. Um, what types of SQL Server high availability are supported? So is Mirror Database possible, for example? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so you can do you can do clustered. Yeah, so we want to we you you leverage whatever uh, on the on the Microsoft side in terms of uh, SQL availability, but obviously we we highly recommend you do that. Hello, hello, sorry, hard for me to see. Go ahead. 
Uh, what, what happens if I install uh, two, 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 two applications that uh, are not compatible and I assign to, to a desktop like uh, Explorer 9 and 10 or something like that? I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of echo off the wall and it was hard for me to understand the question. What happens if, uh, if I install two applications like, like uh, Internet Explorer 9 and uh. Internet Explorer 10 and I assign to the same user? Uh, there'll be a conflict. So conflicts will be honored. It's just as if you installed it locally because for all, all Windows is concerned, these are locally installed applications. So you either have to try to avoid the conflicts by not putting the same application in two different app stacks or you can use ThinApp for isolation. So if you needed to support an earlier version of an application, you could ThinApp it and offer it into the app stack so that it's isolated so you wouldn't have the conflict. But otherwise, yes, conflicts will be honored. We're working on some things around that, so hopefully you know, into next year we'll have some things that will help with that. And, and another question is possible. Uh, have I uh, any way to, um, to limit the size of the writable uh, volume to the user? Yes, so uh, the writable volumes, uh, you, can, you can create multiple templates, so you can use the one out of the box. I can't remember how big the one out of the box is, but you can size it to whatever you need, and that basically, in essence, becomes that user's disk quota, whatever size you give them. Is there any restrictions on uh, load balancer? Uh, any particular configuration, uh, s sessions and so forth, session st stickiness or anything like that? Uh, session sticking? Connected through a client pointing toward a particular uh, app volume manager, does it have to stay with that or is it? Oh, yeah. Um, so if you point a client towards a particular app volume manager, uh, not necessarily because on the next, especially if you've got a load balancer in front of it, the next session, they may, they may connect to another one. Now, if we're talking about view and they've connected, they've logged in and connected, and then they just disconnected, they'll just reconnect and the app volumes will still be mounted. If they log out, it may, it may point them at a different app volumes manager and then they'll just be mounted from there. Hello? Yep, go ahead. Uh, how you handle uh, security updates for applications? So security updates for applications. So what you would do is you'd go through that uh, provisioning process. So I, let's say I have a, an application installed on an on a app volume. I would uh, mount that app stack in provisioning mode to a machine. I'd install the updates. And then I would, I would finish that off, seal it, and then I would provision that new app stack to the user. So I, I would deprovision the old version and reprovision the new version so that on the next login, they got the new version. Uh, full automatic or by hand? Um, automatic is in, in what? In what? So, so you have some uh, connection to a repository, for example, to Adobe and Microsoft and make the updates? Uh, no, this, is, this would be a manual process. You'd, have to, you'd actually have to uh, mount that app stack and, and do the update. Um, if a user had user installed applications, say on their writable volume, and they had automatic updates for that, uh, that would be in place. The, the app stacks themselves are read only, so uh, they, they won't change. In fact, if a user uses an application on an app stack and they do something and mess it up during their session, well, when they're done, it just reverts back to the way it was, so it cleans itself up. Uh, hi, um, I want, want to know uh, what about uh, Windows 10? Uh, Windows 10 support should be coming with uh, 2.10, which will be out in the next few weeks. Okay. And there's a quick question. Um, the user settings in current user registry, uh, where, what happens when, if I detach the, the volume, the app stack volume? Uh, if you detach it, well, an app stack, um, if you detach an app stack, any registry settings that are related to the apps uh, would, be, would be removed. Um, any registry settings that were related to the user, if they were using a writable volume, those would persist. Can I do integration into SCCM? Integration into SSCM, uh, SCCM. Uh, what are you looking for? Using SCCM to create my app volumes? No, not right now. No. Has it roadmap? Uh, not that I know of. I, I, but but I, don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily have visibility to the entire roadmap, so. 
What we're going to do um, to make things a bit easier, just in terms of uh, management, we have a bunch of different things. You've got Horizon, you've got App Volumes, you've got uh, User Environment Manager that all have different consoles. We're working on a unified console that'll come about sort of uh, into next year where we'll, we'll actually start to bring some of the management together, at least internally within our product line. Is the, is the limit of the 15 stacks per VM uh, hard one, or is it just a recommendation? A recommendation. The, the, the hardware limitation is, I think it's 60 VM DKs per VM and 2,048 VM DKs per server. Uh, it's really a recommendation around performance right now. And, and honestly, if you've got a smaller environment, you know, a couple hundred users, you can go higher than that. I mean, we've got use, uh, people using 20 app stacks, so it's, it's, it's sort of a loose uh, number right now. So, yeah. But honestly, we've got a really large customer who's got like 2,200 applications, and they have a very small number of app stacks, and they're delivering all those applications. Uh, yes. Um, you told us about the the profile management will uh, happen, it will disappear or? Yeah, so it won't disappear. We're just going to change the way we do it. And I don't have all the details that I can share right now on how that's going to come about. But uh, so a couple of things about profile. Right now, you can, you can put it in a, a writable volume. We don't necessarily recommend that as a best practice. Um, there are better ways to handle profiles, like, for example, user environment manager. Um, just using a small mandatory profile and letting uh, user environment manager handle all the configuration. So we will have a way to do it with, uh, with the writable volumes and with, with app volumes. It's just going to be a little different than, than the way it is now. So really, the main use case around the writable volume will be user installed applications and user data. And, and just by the way, I didn't, I didn't mention this, but that's very configurable. I can configure the, the the config file that controls the writable volume, and I can, you know, whitelist and blacklist different directory structures if I want to. So if I need to support some specific directory structure for a group of users, I can add that in to make sure it's captured in the writable volume. And the writable volume is, again, a one-to-one -one thing for the user, so it'll move with them from VM to VM. So if I, you know, if I log into uh, uh, one VM today and a different VM tomorrow, so again, a floating desktop, uh, that'll just attach with me as the user as opposed to the, uh, the classic view persistent disk, which was stuck on the virtual machine rather than attached to the user. And the last question is uh, on the keynote, uh, we saw the A square. Yes. Do we have any more description of? Absolutely not. <laughs> how they're doing this? Okay. It's, it's, we're, we're actually still doing a lot of work on that, so it's still very much in flight. But obviously, the concept is to deliver, um, to use AirWatch uh, Enterprise Mobility Management because Windows 10 has EMM APIs and deliver app stacks out to those, those machines to be able to provision applications. But beyond that, how that's all going to work together and what it's going to look like, that's as much as we have now. Stay tuned. All right, well, I appreciate you sticking in for the last session. Safe travels home. Uh, if you've got other questions, I'll hang around for a bit. Feel free to come up and talk to me. But thank you. Oh, and please fill out the survey. <laughs>